Rogers Board of Trustees work session on January 12, 2023. The time is now 4 o'clock. Jessica, please call the roll. Rodney G. Here. Doris Graham. She said here. Craig Larson. Here. Mary Lupke. Here. Kevin and Martin. Here. Ann Marshall. Pam Ross. Here. Doris, we got you here, so you're good to go. This one. Send uh, well wishes to Dr. Graham and her family as her husband's uh, recovering some medical stuff, and that's why she's unable to join us in person today. So, certainly send you our well wishes and hope everything works out on behalf of uh, everyone here, Dr. Graham. Thank you. Thank you. So we're going to go ahead and get started with today's work session. Uh, I did ask the trustees, for those who are in the audience, uh, we won't be having presentations, but more for us to do our homework ahead of time so we can actually have discussion and question and answer for it. We also have a time session for each topic area that we're going to try to hold true to. Uh, we have four topics that we want to discuss today in order to get uh, to this and have discussion. And so certainly want to recognize all those who worked beforehand to present the information. I know the trustees got a chance to provide some questions ahead of time to Jessica, to you all to be able to share those out. So what we'll do is, any question and the answers, we'll have you share those out first, and then we'll dive into questions, other questions and topics and discussion among the board uh, for that, if that works for everyone. The technology folks do ask when you're up here, just make sure you're talking to the microphone so Dr. Graham can hear, otherwise she can't hear if you don't speak in the microphone because of the way the Zoom session is set up. So the first one is guided pathways. So uh, Dr. Langer and Dr. Davis, if you want to come up to the cold seats. And we do have 45 minutes for this topic, trustees, so I will let us know when there's 30, 30 minutes left, 15 minutes left, and no time left. So I know I submitted some questions uh, that we got. So do you want to share out those first, and then we'll dive into the topics around Guided Pathways? The mic's yours. Thank you, Dr. Martin, mm -hmm. uh, trustees, Dr. Pittman. Um, and uh, we, we did uh, see your questions with respect to pathways. We'll um, address those. The first question, well, I'm Andrew Weiner, uh, Vice Chancellor for Academic Affairs. Christine Davis, Vice Chancellor for Student Affairs. And I want to say um, that we are co-chairs of a core team that has been working on this for, for a good bit. And uh, that core team is passionate about this. They're, they're informed about Pathways. They also help provide you know, the, some of the information that you saw in the presentation and some of those responses to questions. So I'm just gonna take one sec, because they're here. I'm just gonna go ahead and make sure that the trustees know who is on the core team for uh, Pathways to Success at St. Louis. So Dr. Felicia Moore Davis is here. and. Felicia's a long time expert on this, and we may lean, depending on how hard the questions are, on uh, some of these participants. Uh, Julie Massey is here. Uh, Juanita Locke, the Executive Director for Online Education. And then Angela Carson is here, and she may be new to some trustees. Uh, she's hit the ground running with respect to Pathways. She works in Dave Haas's area and uh, is a uh, project uh, manager. So. Um, the first question was, uh, what are the 35 identified transfer degree pathway focus areas? So in the slide deck that you got, there was a slide that gave an example of some. And uh, so I have the list of those so that um, trustees can look at the full list. Okay. Clarify the question for me again. What was it? The 35. What are the 35 identified transfer degree pathway focus areas? But these are in transfer degrees. Yes. That's the list. You'll notice that many of these are things you might expect to find on a, on a uh, student's wish list for transferring and getting a bachelor's degree in a four-year institution. Um, the second question that we got beforehand uh, was, when will course elimination take place, and what is the timeline for that? 
And, uh, or is this a, a two-step a process, a two-step process? And um, the, answer, the answer to that question is that the work um, in reducing, so part of Pathways is making sure that the students have a, 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 the right amount of choices and not a, an overabundance of them and slimming things down. So the work will begin this spring, right now, the spring semester, by looking at historical data, fill rates, and the information provided in our college catalog about the requirements for our programs. Uh, we anticipate that we can make some decisions that could affect change on the fall 2023 schedule. That's next fall. But these will have to be carefully considered as that, that fall semester is built, right? Students will start to see that next month and start to jump into those classes in March. Um, but our opportunity to make changes for the spring of 2024 will be greater because th that semester has not been built yet. And also, as we move through, you may have noticed this in the slides, as we move through this semester, we'll be doing the academic program alignment where we look at the focus areas and the programs and see where they align and then see what courses are outliers in that process. So we think we can affect a greater change for spring of 2024 than we can for uh, fall of 2023. But you also might have noticed in the slide deck that there are some technologies that we're implementing that are going to use our, our students' data, and uh, that's DegreeWorks and, and Ad Astra. And the team believes that we'll have those implemented uh, and usable so that that can affect change in the summer of 2024 uh, and moving forward from there. So I think the trustees could expect to see um, slimming down starting with the fall, although that will have to be cautious, more for the spring and fully implemented in the summer. So just to get clarity on, on that um, piece of it, and part of us have more background than others with it. So I guess what I'm really getting at with that question is to ensure, A, let me go backwards even more. I think the whole board recognizes that this is a major shift for the college. This is a heavy lift that's going to be transformational that we may get pushback from groups. Um, for those folks in the room, I think I can say confidently, you have the support of the entire board in moving forward and making the right decisions that may anger people. We recognize that there, and that's why we are holding public work sessions on these topics. We're being very trans, transparent in our information because we're not trying to hide the fact of what, we're, what direction we're trying to go. And so, I want to make sure you all know that you have the support of us and Dr. Pittman in our conversations and moving forward even with roadblocks that may come. And so we're going to keep reiterating that message to folks because we know change is difficult and we know this is thinking very differently about how the college could operate to meet the needs of today's student. And so um, with that, I know this biggest lift, in my opinion, is the elimination of courses to align, so for example, not having, I'll look at the first one, psychology is the very first one here. We might not offer 35 psychology classes. We may shrink it down to five classes you pick from, which therefore could upset 30 people who teach those 30 classes that get eliminated. Um, so with that in mind, do we think all of that work will be done by spring 2024 enrollment start date? And if not, what date are we thinking would be when we would have all of that done? And there's no right answer in my mind with that. I just want to be on the same page. And then Mary has something to add on that as well. Uh, let me start by saying appreciate the support because these will be very tough uh, decisions. Uh, you probably heard uh, leaders, the boss, say things like cafeteria model and, and uh, things like that when talking about a catalog of, of courses. Um, so there is going to be p possibly some, some folks who are, feel like we're taking choices away from students if you don't have um, all of the things that we had before necessarily in the catalog. So the time frame that, that I have, uh, that the team has in their mind is, is the summer of 24 for when we'll be able to not just use um, you know, our catalog, historical data, and enrollment trends. But when we have degree works in Ad Astra in there, we'll be able to look at the student's academic plan, our students, their academic plan, and then what do we need to schedule so that they can meet those requirements. 
And um, so that means that there will be some number of courses, which we don't know today, that aren't, aren't a required element in there. And so they, um, they won't be in the schedule uh, the same way that they are now, and that will create some friction. Um, but the other thing I want to make sure that's clear is we also have to continue. That's, I think that's the date you want, but that won't be the end of it, right? So we have to continue to monitor our students as they transfer, see if there's things we need to add because we're missing an important piece that they need, uh, or see if there's something we need to take out because we find it's not. So we'll continue to CQI this after that uh, using uh, transfer data and things like that. But I, that's, the, that's the gold date we have right now for kind of fully implemented using the technologies we purchased. And if we took out the transfer degrees and focused on the, let me get the right terminology right. Uh, is it, it's not pathways, it's the meta majors. The meta majors and like, arts and science in those interest areas, those courses are also going to have some elimination in those areas of how to get to those as well. So do you vision that would be the same date to kind of eliminate those courses and not just transfer? Because I view this as going at the same time, not one and then doing the other three years later. Yes, I, I don't think that the date for the programs is past that in the future. I think that there's probably some things we can do with programs just a little bit sooner because those plans are built, right? We know what those look like semester to semester. Where these focus areas we haven't developed in the college, so um, we, those things are, uh, two thirds of them you may have noticed are, are done, uh, more of them done this month with, with the 35 that we currently have on the books. That uh, honestly uh, probably lags a little bit. I think what we intend to do in this first step is look through, here's all of the uh, courses that are required in our programs, and um, what's, the, what's the difference between that, those requirements, and what we have in the schedule? And can we make any decisions about that sooner than we have this fully implemented? So, Mayor? <clears throat> uh, this is monumental work, and it's needed to be done for decades. And what I do want to emphasize is this is not the college that was the college that was originated with this kind of plan. This kind of plan served 30,000 students. This kind of plan did not have online education. We didn't have another facility. But well, there's been a lot of changes. So this kind of um, pathway is essential. I, and not, I don't even think it's good work, and it's one of you doing it. I don't know how we could modify the way we educate today without doing it. That's first. Secondly, um, we had COVID. People became comfortable with online teaching. They became comfortable with online classes. We see that when we look at our online classes growing. So that makes a difference. Uh, finally, no one's at a class. Like if you were literally take something down to 10 classes and your students who want it, there's no rules that you can't add a class to a curriculum that I know of. You know, if you got 10 classes and 20 students are out there, add 11. Uh, there's not going to be any limitation on that, is there? Additional sections of the same class yeah. that they felt. No, that that's that's part of kind of the goal is to make sure that we have the right volume of the right classes. That's it. So so when we say we're eliminating classes, uh, that's not what I hear. Right. Well, I, I think we're in on that. Mm -hmm. Just to take the burden off, Kevin. Uh, to some extent, we are wanting to look at sections or or classes, not sections, classes that you know are low enrollment that uh, there's, I think there's two ways this could be thought of. One would be literally do we need to offer this particular class any longer because we don't, right. we don't maybe even offer it every semester, you know, it, periodically it gets offered or whatnot, but it still takes resources and, and you know, have, mm -hmm. they, every, every one of those has to be studied and thought through, right? So that's an issue. I think the other thing that's true is that because we start off the way you described so accurately in larger volume in multiple locations, we may offer a course on three campuses and maybe it's slightly different or now we need to take this course in order to line up to this, this major when it would be smarter for us to have a generic 
you use psychology. Psychology one course that you know a student can take anywhere. It's a, you know it's a common curriculum. That's literally one of the core 42 courses. So you know that's maybe not a good example, but the culling could mean getting rid of some current classes or variations well, I, on I don't classes. I think that's a problem. What I'm trying to say is I don't think that's a problem. You well, know, it might be a problem if you're teaching it. Well, I, I don't know what to say about that. You can't teach five students yeah, year after year after year and in, course, in program after program and expect the institution to be self-sufficient. And it's, and it's, you need consistency of instruction. So if I take psychology at flow, one, when I take psychology two at Wildwood, I better have taken the same course. So all of that consistency needed to be looked at. One of the things, you know, you know, I don't see it as eliminating. I see it as realistically looking at courses that are offered. Real, and, and I'm a very much a faculty advocate. But the college has to have, many courses require interaction among students. So let's have 10 students or 12 students in that class for you know optimum sharing and learning. I, I don't see it as eliminating. I also don't see it as fearful right now from the people I've talked to as it was when it was first introduced. People, are, And I come from a program that has had this for 25 years, you know, that you take A and then B and then C. Um, the, the classes for transfer to college, if you want to be a four-year student, have not changed. They're all there. Uh, so I, I, I don't think. I don't know that any of us are disagreeing with you. So I don't think this it's is a little hard to kind of in the abstract talk about this. But I, what I do, I think, what's important is planning backwards, which is to say we're going to mostly through relationships with businesses and employers right. in the area say here's a a major or a medical, sure. you know, whatever you want to call mm -hmm. it, that clearly has good, high-paying jobs at the end of it. How many? What's the market for that? Are we doing that right now? Should we be developing something different? So in a lot of ways, that's growth, right? But it's growth towards a goal, which is completion and getting that's right. our students employed and, and, and contributors to our whole economy. But you want classes that have the appropriate number of students in them. I, it's important to have students interact with students. And, and I'm assuming some of those majors, or, or I'm not sure what we're going to call them, pathways is yeah. what we started, but some of them may be a few dozen students, but you know, highly needed in the community and good, good paying jobs. There's nothing wrong with doing that. Some of them may be hundreds, like nursing. So and I'm not asking, I'm not suggesting that we eliminate. If somebody's on a pathway and they get to, this is the class they need to graduate, and there's only five students, I say go with that class and let these people graduate. I'm not saying that. Um, the elephant in the room for me always, always is advising. So we can set this up, it can be ready to go, it can be perfect, and if students aren't advised into the correct pathway and they're not followed up with, you did, I don't know, psychology one, now you're ready for two, or you can't move on, you know, to the next level of where you're headed. So are we changing how we educate the advisors or how the advisors educate the students? We, we've done a lot of work with advising over the last three years, uh, Mary. And um, most recently we went to a case management model where um, we're actually reaching out to the students versus waiting for the students to come to us. So we're managing a caseload of students. Um, and the next, so that was phase one of the, of the restructure in academic advising. Phase two of that, which we will begin now, is to really combine career counseling, career advising with academic advising and making sure that those things, that's one and the same. Students come here to get a degree, and like you said, Dr. Larson would begin with the end goal in mind. The end is to get a job, so we start there, and we advise students, whichever the program that they decide they want to go into, with a career in mind. And so that's, that's the next phase of advising. And that's really important because over the years, I've seen too many students run out of financial aid because they were not advised. Or, and that's nobody's fault. Too many people, not enough people, I don't know. But people who were not familiar with the student or the path the student wanted. And, and, and part of that is the reducing choice. 
And so the, the choice conversation is really about, so for example, at the college we have, as part of our core 52, we have a humanities requirement where we say to students, you have these 20 options to pick from to fulfill your human, I'm, and I'm just making up that number. Yeah. It may be less, it may be more, some number that to fulfill the, the humanities requirement. So as part of this work that we're talking about in Pathways is, do we need 20 choices for students to look at? Are those 20 choices too overwhelming for students? So how we package those, so when we talk about course elimination and choice, that's really what we're talking about. So students are not taking excess credit because we want, obviously we want to eliminate that. We don't want them taking ex excess credit, running out, of, running out of financial aid and then not, not graduating. Right, because there has been discussions in the past, and, and I'm, not, I'm not particularly for this, but I could see reasons for it, for instructors to do advising, because they know their programs, and they know what the students need to move through their programs, and I'm thinking particularly in humanities courses or, or, or theater or those courses where you say, well, they don't know what we do. So the communication between programs to the advisors, so they do know what we do, and then the advisors, you know, staying in touch with these students so they don't go, I don't think the students care if, they, I mean, they do, if there's 20 things to pick from in humanities. They just want to know that they need a humanity. But I think, Mary, that's where this is going to take us, where we might get some friction, is we're not going to give 20 choices anymore. Because that's where people are getting off their step and pathway of getting too many classes or getting too far because we have too many choices so then one advisor is like, oh, go take this class. Well, then you already have that credit met. You don't need that class, so now you're repeating the same credit. So we are going to have a repurposing of sections and elimination of courses, but it doesn't mean we're going to limit the number of sections we have. We're going to eliminate courses and repurpose those sections to be in less course offerings so that way it's more targeted. So if Pam wants to send her granddaughter here, Pam's granddaughter <laughs> wants to study in exercise science, she knows for this credit, these are my two class options. Right, right now there might be 20 options to choose from. Well then Pam's daughter's like, oh I want her granddaughter wants to take three of those classes. Well Pam's daughter doesn't, granddaughter doesn't need three of those classes. She only needs one of those. So by eliminating some of those will hopefully help us keep students on path advisors more focused in knowing what they need to take, but that there is going to be friction because to Craig's point also, people have been stuck teaching this course XYZ for 20, 15 years and that course is not going to be offered in that form and fashion. It's going to be offered in some other way that's more aligned so we don't have as many offerings. It's just like textbooks. That's a whole other issue you get to, not today, but we offer too many textbook choices. So you take a class, you take a class, Jeff takes a class, three different textbooks, one costs $50, one costs $300 for the same exact course. How is that learning experience the same as well? And I won't get in textbook freedom, so I don't want to get there. It's there today, that kind of works. Well, I do agree with that. Yeah, two things have right. to happen. First, you have to be working with the individual disciplines you know, over time and talking to them and saying, what classes do you think are valuable? You're looking at the numbers, you know, so that when you do eliminate, you don't get 20 choices in humanities. Uh, the faculty, the chairs, they're not surprised by that because they were involved in the input of deciding it. The second thing is, an advisor shouldn't be telling you to take another course if on your pathway you've already taken the humanities. The advisor shouldn't be saying, take that course. Agreed. They shouldn't be. Dr. Martin? Yes. Yeah, so and again, if, if you study guided pathways, it, it is about reducing student choices. And if you look at all the data from the Community College Research Center, you'll see that those institutions that have done that improve student completion. And you also improve student completion in regards to they're not taking too many hours. So, um, you know, what the exercise we're going to go through, I know it's probably not going to be very popular, but. Two, I think two of the criteria that we need to look at, and uh, Andrew and I talked about this this week, how, if you just look at the focus areas for our one general transfer degree, do those align with a career if the student completes a bachelor's degree? I mean, I think that's a key criteria. I think another one is we can look at enrollments of where students interest are. And I saw some data, preliminary data today, that suggest there's really only a few of these areas that students are really that interested in. So I, I think that there's some things that we need to 
consider here. And I have a question, I apologize. I, I just saw this list yesterday, so I haven't had time to debrief with staff. But Andrew, accounting, you've got accounting down as a GTS focus area. Is that the same as the accounting program, or is that different in regards to how the curriculum lays out and what students take? So it's, <clears throat> at St. Louis Community College, we have both, you. right? You can, you can come here and, and get an associates of uh, applied science and accounting, uh, but many students want to transfer and further their education. And uh, this is one of the things that um, you may have noticed in the definition slide, oh, thank you, um, that uh, while we might kind of think about our, our especially looking backward, we might see our catalog as these are career areas and these are transfer areas. Um, many of our university transfer partners have decided that a lot of our career programs, you can transfer there and continue on, right? So um, we have a good number of, in fact, uh, I think, did you just pass this to everybody? Yes. Mm -hmm. Okay, so that some of the data that uh, Dr. Pittman was talking about is from a report that Institutional Research and Planning put together last spring for, um, for this Pathways core team to think about, you know, what focus areas make sense. So um, just helping you wade through a little bit, um, Dr. Pittman's focused on, <laughs> focused on the focus areas, um, which is, was, the, was the first handout. The first two pages of the second handout you got gives you a little bit of information that's probably not too surprising, like where our students transfer um, in, in, in terms of our university friends. And uh, then the next page gives some information about, you know, where, like what state. And uh, <clears throat> then it gives you a little bit of information on the bottom of the second page about the top majors at St. Louis Community College. You know, we have a, a lot of students who come here and say they want to transfer, but, um, I think one of the key questions is the, yeah, the right number of focus areas, and uh, there's some information on pages three and four that tell you a bit about, by, by SIP code, so this, this gives you information as our students transfer about what they chose, okay, when they, when they transferred, and, and as you go through the tables on page three and four, the information gets more and more tightly coupled to a very specific program. So it's a little bit more general in the first, uh, the first table on the top of page three. So 196 students from St. Louis Community College in this cohort we looked at, when they transferred on, went into business manage management, marketing, and those kinds of things. Uh, that, so that's a big one. And, uh, and <clears throat> then if you um, look at the, next table down, it kind of disaggregates that a little bit more, but you'll see the patterns are, are similar, right? So business is still near the top. In the first table, the second line says health professions and related programs. So that's a little bit broader bucket. Which page are you talking about? Uh, page three. Okay, I'm looking at it, but I, I don't see where the, um, the zip code so oh, I'm sorry, I, I should have enunciated that a little bit better. S SIP code, oh, CID, yeah, SIP I code, it's probably my, I, I'm from Iowa, that's probably my, my <laughs> a little bit of affect there, <laughs> SIP code. Um, Thank so, you. You bet. Um, so those codes really are just kind of designating, uh, you know, the curriculum as, as it goes to the four-year school in more detail. But you, I just, you, some patterns emerge there as you look through it, I think that that's, Dr. Pittman's dialing into is, um, you know, is this the, is this, are these the right ones, uh, the, th the 30 plus ones that we have? Um, do some of them overlap? I think that the question about, you know, accounting being in this list along with um, things like business and marketing and maybe economics and things like that, is, is that a similar bucket so that we could make sure students are, are focused? Do those look very similar in the first two years? Um, and so I'm, I'm thinking this data is helpful to, to think about um, as, you, as you look at those focus areas. And there's kind of two pieces, right? So Dr. Pittman mentioned there's a piece which is, is it clear that, oops, is it clear that pathway leads to a career, right? And also, how much interest is there in it, right? Do we have a pile of students? Because we don't want to 
say to a pile of students, you can't do that here unless it's a very strategic decision. And um, so you can see them from top to bottom, how, pop, you know, how popular they are and then how they're categorized. We don't have these currently, right? Or we do have these? Like, do students identify these? I'm just curious, like, do we have enrollment numbers to say, oh, we have one student in geography and we have 3,500 in biology? Not yet. I do, I, I'm, I'm, go ahead. How does this align to our workforce data that we, we gather every year? So I, I am going to go back to Craig's previous comment. And, and then just, this is great. This is the now. What I'm interested in is, in three years from now, what is our workforce asking us for? What is the regional workforce? And we do it every year, but I'm not seeing an alignment, at least not for me, to what our workforce needs are from the region. And I can't tell you enough, I think our client is not in the buildings with us. I think our client is outside of these buildings. Our products is students. That's the way I think about the work we have to do. So if there's no alignment to the external workforce, like nursing, for example, right, real alignment, then this doesn't help me say if we're focused on the right things. Who do the right work? And we are. But are we focused on the right areas? Yeah, that's what that's what Trustee G supports that that thought. And I agree with you completely. And I think it's important that we remember we are a community college, now funded largely by the taxpayers right here in this region. So maybe our number one goal is to improve the economy. I mean, I'm not sure that I feel comfortable saying that. No, the goal is to help students go from wherever they are to a good career and a good job that, that allows them to live a good life. But in some ways, those are the same thing. They're just, if you want to work with the partners, you got to work with the partners. you got to say, what are the jobs that you're looking for? And I don't know if we can be 10 years out. We can probably be three or four years out. So we need to be really immediately saying, OK, uh, express what you're looking for. And, and we do that. I mean, it is interesting. We do the state of the workforce, so we kind of do some of the best work in the state around that. Why wouldn't we use that to decide how are we going to push students through advising? You know, and, and unfortunately, and I work in the K-12 world too, and unfortunately, a lot of the students that are struggling really don't have a clear sense of what their options are and how much it would make a difference to them and their family if they pass the damn math class. I mean, you know, get serious about it. But if they just don't know. So it's not going to be a lot easier, you know, when they're a couple of years older. I think that, uh, you know, when you look at the state of St. Louis workforce, the, the areas we're focusing on now are clearly aligned with the sectors. Healthcare, IT, financial services, advanced manufacturing, biotechnology. If you read the ballot language of what we just did, those words are all in there. Yeah. So I, I think that you know what we're focusing on with the career programs are aligning well with that. Um, tomorrow I'm meeting with Mercy South. They will overwhelm me with ideas on what we can put in South County. <laughs> we will not have enough resources to put in South County what they want to do. So yeah, I, I think it's critical that we we continue to work with them, uh, with the employer base. And I think it's critical that we make the students aware the, of, the, of the opportunities for great careers and salaries, even after you know, a certificate or an associate degree program, they can gain immediate employment. So I think a lot of this exercise certainly is to talk about improving graduation rates, reducing student choices, collegial efficiencies, but I think ultimately what you're getting at is the redeployment of resources to the highest need areas in this college. And I think that that's at least my understanding of my task as we go through Guided Pathways. Mary? Um, when you get to budgets and such, I will have nothing to say. So I apologize for this. <laughs> I knew this one's going to take longer. Anyway, so. <laughs> um, <laughs> and I, I agree. I, I, I just always agree with both of you as, as you are talking you. about oh what we need to do. But our product, as I look at it from my perspective, is education. Now, it can be education in an eight-week course. It can be education in a 
a, a you know, year certificate, it could be education in a specialized program, but this is called a guided pathway. And the reason it's called guided is students don't often, we're, we're talking about students who might know what they want, but most often a student will come in and say, well, I talked to my advisor, you know, and they told me to do this, or I talked to my advisor, and they told we are educating these people, and education can only happen for those students if they know what they signed up for, if we have the appropriate courses for them in the appropriate numbers, and if they are guided, you know, many students come into college and have no, I mean, they like, uh, think they might like to be a nurse. They don't know what that means. You know, or they, they think they want to go to college because their parents are telling them to go to a four-year institution later. They don't know what that means. Or they are available and ready if they knew, and I'm, I'm going with uh, workforce development as well, if they knew in eight weeks they could get finished and get an interview. So I think a great deal, of, it's just my opinion, but just from experience and from having us children and grandchildren all over college, somebody needs to help them guide them. And they can't be guided through 100 courses. And we don't have the resources to offer 100 courses, and we shouldn't be, it's poor education. So if our product is education, then let's find whether it's an eight-week course or a two-year course or going to college, that they're guided correctly and I keep taking this back to that advisor. I'm, going to, I'm just beating that drum. This is perfect. We need to do this. This should have been done a long time ago. We don't need to offer classes that are necessary. They need to get job ready if that's the curriculum they've chosen and they're going in and get out of there in eight weeks and, and go to McDonald Douglas. But they don't know this stuff. We're making assumptions that they know what to pick. They don't know what to pick often, and that's what we're supposed to help them with as part of our charge not just to educate them in the classroom, but to educate them in how to function in this system and other systems. So this is very necessary, but if, if, if people are not guiding them into all the things that Craig's talking about, and you, you don't know what you don't know. Well, I think maybe that's where slide 18, the implementation of a career coach is so critical that we're gonna be implementing that too to help people guide towards a career path, because I totally agree with, with what you're saying people don't know even in K-12 as much work as we do in K-12 to get people to understand pathways, what do you want to do, what you're interested in. They still come to us and still don't know. Craig? Okay. So I have kind of a different question. It's more, more fundamental. I feel like as a, go a governance function, we're adopting a system that we're going to live with for a long time. So I'm looking at these six meta majors, and I'm wondering, how do I know that's the right six meta majors? How did that work get done? Have we been comparing ourselves to others? When I, when I look at some of the, the language in there, it looks like those are more academic. I mean, I, I think we need people to look at our homepage or early college material and, and see jobs, you know, as, as what are embedded in there. Uh, and these could be exactly right. I don't know that. I just think the board shouldn't move forward and adopt something that we're going to have to live with because it's so much work to change down the line. I mean, I'm all for continuous improvement, but I think some decisions are big, and I think this is one of them. So I would, I mean, I mentioned to Jeff that now that I've done a little reading in this, I know there are national conferences, there are folks that are really looking at this, and we're not the only people, and I think it would be good to inform ourselves. Thank you. Thank you. Have a good one. Okay. Uh, Thanks, Dr. Graham. Bye, Dr. Graham. Bye. Oh, I'm not leaving yet. They're late coming. But I just wanted to say that uh, I agree with you, Craig, with these. So they're not really cut in concrete, are they? Because time changes. Do you hear me? Yes. yes. We're going to let Andrew answer, I think. Thank you. Um, well, I, I'm going to ask him then. <laughs> I don't have that paper, but, uh, but I know we have to be flexible. You're giving us information based on the data that you have. 
But, you know, things can change. Yes, um, I, I think that um, things can change. The meta majors are a big decision. <clears throat> uh, from my vantage point, it's one of the things in Pathways work we've done so far that I feel more, most confident on. Uh, there, if you compare our six to other colleges who are with us or ahead of us in this, the buckets are similar. We do have pro some unique programs to us that you have to, to put into to one of those, um, but they're, I, I feel like they're, um, they're, they're pretty safe and, and pretty similar to what you see uh, in kind of the best practices on this. Um, I would, I know we got a, that Dr. Martin's got a pretty tight clock on this, and he's probably noticed that I didn't answer the third question that he sent. And it, I did. And, it, and it all, it, I think it also overlaps with something Trust G, <coughs> excuse me, Trustee G asked or mentioned a little bit earlier. So the third question um, that we got in preparation for this is, uh, what are the future programs that the market and students are demanding that we add? Like, well, how are we looking at the workforce stuff? Dr. Pittman mentioned, you know, the state of the, we've been really good stewards to the area with the state of the St. Louis workforce. And, um, and there's a little bit of foreshadowing that I didn't do here, but um, health care is one of the things we know we need. And, uh, and the college has already tried it, or already worked to transform on this. And so it's probably no surprise that a good number of the things that we're going to be adding and expanding in the next two years are in that lane. Uh, by my count, there's five new programs in health science that are going to be coming on board by 2025. Um, and, and what would those be? Things like nuclear medical technology, uh, magnetic resonance imaging, accelerated clinical laboratory science. Uh -huh. Uh, you probably know about this one. I, I'm going to take a little bit of a, a victory lap on this. One of them is going to be a Bachelor's of Science in Respiratory Care. We're going to be one of the first community colleges to have that. And um, uh, you probably heard Dr. Pittman talk about the other one, and that's LPN, where there's a big, uh, this is something we you know, talked about uh, for a while, but there's a need for this, an expanding need for it. And, and Beyond those five, there are seven more programs that we're expanding because we see the demand from our students and, and from, our, from our employers. So we do pay close attention to the state of the St. Louis workforce as we, as we add programs. I think we've been very careful at St. Louis Community College since 2015. I know the board's aware we implemented and there's some slides in the back about program viability because higher education is really good at uh, adding to the train and not taking something off, right? And uh, so we've been careful about additions over the last bit, but we've also been trying to make sure the programs we have are viable. Um, we had 107 programs in 2015, 2015, 2016, and now we have 74. That's about a 30% reduction. And those 74 even have some programs that kind of stack, like a certificate into an associate. So there's really about 61 lanes, actually. So that's, that's a pretty significant uh, drop. So we've been, we've been paring that back, making sure those are viable. We're adding these health science programs. I'm going I'm to mention just a couple of others, just um, so that you know we're not just looking uh, at, at health care. Um, one of them, uh, you probably know we've added some courses in this because it used to be this was a little bit of a touchy subject, but uh, cannabis is um, in demand uh, as content. Um, and uh, we, uh, we started by adding a course. We're up to three courses in this, but we need some programming because that's an industry in need in our area. I don't know. When you drive uh, to where I live, you see this. <laughs> and, um, before this had come up as maybe a need, but now it's it's legal and Is it's bartending. <laughs> not yet. We're one of the largest horticulture programs in the region. So it is, uh, and these courses are in our horticulture area. Okay, so um, I would mention that. Uh, the other thing I would mention, as as we're running out of time, that uh, you know we've engaged with uh, Ruffalo, Ruffalo Noah Levitz, and one of the things that we've asked for them to do is to make sure they're, they're going to do um, what they call, <coughs> excuse me, is an ac academic program demand analysis and make sure that the academic programs 
that we're offering are the ones that our community needs and give us input on that. So we're using our state of the St. Louis workforce to inform this. We're making sure our programs are viable. And then we're going to have that external resource, too. You know, Andrew, one security. thing I don't want to lose, though, with yeah. Trustee G's comments <laughs> are what, what we call our meta majors based on what the sectors are in our community, which are clearly defined. Mm -hmm. um, when you look at any of the data from America or the state of Missouri, th those are clearly defined. So I think having similar nomenclature on these pathways, I think that's what Dr. Larson's talking about, is yeah, that I people mean, can I look at it. I don't have a proposal, but I and they understand that's it. the issue. Yeah. They can understand. Like you look yeah, at health professions, you understand. real jobs listed there. So immediately people are thinking, yeah, you know, that's what I can do. health professions, oh, what's that mean? No. Which I think it would be listed on. So I, I do think, you know, cybersecurity is yeah. one, just out of curiosity, if we're looking at expanding that, is there's a need, or do we decide, you know, there's other people in the region that are better at offering that. It's not, not something we want to gander into. I think, you know, when we look at this one report that you share about business is one of the highest ones. I wonder about finance and those other areas. Are we crypto and all those other things that are coming to the world? Like, there's a lot of people who want to study business and finance and other things, are we looking at expanding some of those areas as well to offer from some of our students as programs that they could have a two-year degree in finance or crypto or those other emerging markets? Cybersecurity is one I think a lot of. I know we have coding through some of the partnerships, and sometimes it's not best to create a whole program. It's better to offer other programs to other people than offering it for that. But I do want to go back to two things to kind of get some consensus among the group on to give some feedback to the, these leaders here. Where do we stand with these six meta majors, uh, which again are different than this? So I know we spent a lot of time on the general transfer programs, and we're going to second consensus point would be that this other one kind of these fall into those kind of, uh, but there's a lot of our programs come from these other areas. Do we feel that we need more work on the meta major six topics? Do we feel we need? Where do we feel as a board? we need to give direction and kind of, I know we're not voting on anything today, but I don't want us to not like something and then they go through all this work moving forward with something and we're like. Your thoughts? Dr. Graham, your yeah. thoughts? My thoughts? Yeah. I think they've done a lot of work and I am, I'm proud of the work they've done, but I just want to make sure that those meta majors that they're going to look at, that we can go forth. But at one point, if we see that there needs to be a change, that we are able to make that change. Got it. Thank you. Mary, your thoughts? Uh, my, my one thought is the, the concern that there's going to be respect or whatever. But I, I really want to reiterate about the quality of the faculty. We have outstanding educators, and, then, and their goal is the same goal, to get students through, to get them educated, and to move them forward to be successful, whether it's an eight-week course or two years. And I think they're strong partners and feel like they're strong partners. We have outstanding faculty. They're not all going to say, look, I want an eight o'clock class and I'm going to talk about it. No, they're going to find ways to make this work for students because the faculty that we have care very much about the mission of our college. But they care more, and they're standing with the students every day in class. So I cannot stress enough how much, instead of thinking there's going to be a lot of blowback, I think we're going to have strong partnership with the faculty. And I think that's going to be a very positive thing. So your thoughts on these six? Are you good with these six? Do you want more work? Is there some clarity you would like differently? Um, I, I, I think that we need to look at the data. You know, when the numbers justify it, when you can say I can show why we're doing this, I think the Everybody would agree. If you have the data and you can show why it's necessary, I, I think everybody would agree that let's do it. Yeah, there, there are four that I can clearly get behind right now today. Uh, the first bullet point, science, the STEM majors, the health professions, advanced manufacturing, and the business management, culinary arts, and hospital. I can get behind those four. 
The other two, I need, we need to dig in a little bit deeper. Thank you. Pam? Well, I think less is more in this regard. So um, right-sizing is, I would say, the most important thing that we can do because we, you know, we need to make it easy for them to see the path and not be diverted into all, you know, how many 18, 19-year-old people like to get, you know, oh, let's go here and then let's go here. And I think that that's something that I, I really appreciate right-sizing it and making it clear to young people. Thank you. Craig? <coughs> I, you already I kind of agree with what Rodney said. Some of them seem pretty obvious, but are logical. A couple I'd like to see. I disagree with them. And I'll add, echo that. I think just looking again, let's look at the workforce report. Are there categories out there the workforce says that we could better align some areas with? You know, I think I'm a pretty educated person, and I would struggle to identify what falls under social and behavioral sciences, for example. Um, what is design? I could mean a lot of things. So are there those two? I would almost agree with what people are saying here. The, there's four that are pretty simple that everyone can know, but there's some that I would just wonder: can we change the naming so it's very clear what falls under those pathways? Um, you, even human services. Yes, you might know it's social work, you might know it's some other things, but is it very necessarily clear with that? But does that give you all some clarity and direction of how to finalize and wrap this up? Dr. Pittman, are you good with that? Yeah, and I think I could easily theorize that the team had work, looked at the programs we had and tried to fit them in so many buckets. And I think what I'm hearing is we need to define what is the priorities for the college and the community going forward in terms of programming. Is that, is that a fair assessment? And rename what, these what are those? What are those priorities? Where are resources going? Yep. And rename them. Okay. The, yep. the other one is, like I said, no time. See, when Andrew, you're the keeper of the time, you can change the time. So um, is, uh, is this list, which I know we spent a lot of time on. And so Dr. Walsh and I have had quite a conversation around, I won't get in the philosophy debate today about, you know, I'll mention it, but we won't necessarily get fully into it, is, are there majors that you hear about in society where parents always say, why do you go to school to study that and you can't even get a job in that, or the job field is going to lead to a $25,000 a year job? So should we be part of that problem to give kids, students choices or not? But really, I guess my thing is about consensus is more around these as they refine these still is do we need to duplicate? So what I mean by that is Dr. Pittman had mentioned accounting is already a, a program. Do we need to have it under here too and have it there? Should it be under both places? Should it be under one place so it's not as confusing of where well, you can get a general transfer pathway of accounting or just get a degree in accounting and move that way? You have something to say, Dr. Davis. I can see it on your face. <laughs> Say what you want. It's a work session. Right. So I think, um, free. you know, we offer a general transfer degree, and a lot of students don't know what that means. Um, and so this was a way for us to, uh, to show students their end goals, that they can do that here. They can do two years here and transfer to So for example. Do we need 35 focus areas? We could certainly look at that and, and narrow that list. I think we've had some conversations as a group about what that might look like. But we do offer a general transfer degree. Um, you know, after long got a degree in sociology, I realized the world is changing. Um, and so no, I may not encourage my daughter to go get a degree in sociology today. Um, but we do have a general transfer degree for those students who do want to come and get a degree in the arts and music and philosophy or psychology or sociology if that's what they choose. And it's, it is about 50% of our student population. So. And I do think once we actually roll these out, we'll get some clarity around where the numbers are at in terms of and be able to eliminate some of these. So if we don't have, to Mary's point, if only five students are signing up for number 32, we don't just keep offering that program and we eliminate that pathway or whatever you want to call call that yeah, as well. I, I am strongly, strongly advocating that we do not eliminate liberal arts. Um, we are educating citizens here as well as people to go in the workforce and liberal arts have a great amount of value so I want to be really careful before we decide that, um, I don't know, um, theater is not important, you know, or whatever, that we may redesign it, we may look at it a different way, but I don't think as a responsible institution we can eliminate liberal arts. So, uh, and so that's what it sounds like. That was just a philosophy question oh, earlier, but 
Yeah, and for me, I'm, I'm looking at Mary Moore at we have accounting, economics, and finance under GTS. That seems like an over, a lot of overlap no, to I me that, that you could probably collapse some of these things mm -hmm. um, is where I'm coming from. You know, but I don't want a student who's gifted parents not letting them explore what they want to say, perhaps music, because you can't get a job at the end of it. You don't know that. You know, I, and there's value there for the arts in general. So we have to have 100 art classes or, you know, theater courses, or, but we can't eliminate those courses. They have so much value. Yeah. Rob, are you, do you think we need to just condense the list, keep yeah, the list? It, it needs to be condensed, for sure. There's some overlap. Okay. Pam? Well, <clears throat> I don't really have any more to say about it. Okay. Yeah, it probably needs to be condensed. And, and I think the last thing you said is about 50% of our students currently are, are wanting to do general transfers. And I think this work is not designed to keep those students away. They're, they're probably coming. Maybe we can treat, help them make better decisions about not taking 70 hours when you could get out of here with 60 and go on to Umsel. But if they want to take 70 hours because they're wanting to explore and they don't worry about the money, Obviously, we don't care. I mean, you know, it's a good thing. I also think, think theater or music, you know, if they've got student enrollment and they play a good role in, in, in you know, the culture of the campus, why would you get rid of that? And I don't think that's what we're talking about here at all. No, I, I mean, to me, you're, you're talking about efficiencies in some regards in very similar disciplines yeah. is the way I see this, that you don't have repetitive courses or curriculum that's just going to spread yeah. the student population out and water down and, and he'll have a lot of additional costs that way as well and it's not efficient for the students. Yeah. So that's that I think that's where you're all coming from. I don't think anybody was advocating for getting rid of, getting rid of liberal arts or music no. or anything along those lines, Mary at all. Dr. Graham, did you want to say anything? Okay. I don't, I don't think so. Okay. And I any clarity you all need from us? Anything else? Mm -hmm. I don't think so. Okay. Thank well, you. good thing next week's meeting is short, and so we won't have any updates then. But thank you so much for your work, and uh, appreciate it. If you need anything, let us know. Otherwise, we look forward to the next update in the work ahead. Thank you. Okay. The next topic is strategic plan. Good evening, Chair Martin, trustees, and Chancellor Pittman. Okay, so he did not have any questions ahead of time from me that I got submitted. So this one is really up for a discussion about the strategic plan. If you remember last strategic plan, uh, I don't believe Mary, you were on the board last strategic plan when we approved it, but the mission changed, the vision changed, we came over the core values. There's a significant shift in the thought process. And uh, I have the July. That so yeah, this was even before that when we approved the new strategic plan. So in this one, uh, we got an update of where they're at, the timeline, and so I will leave it open for trustees if they have any questions about anything, and they have identified three themes, uh, creating exceptional student experience, improving operational efficiencies, and a best place to work for the new strategic plan through 24 through 26. So this is a chance for any other trustees' discussions. Other questions, other thoughts, or concerns are regarding the strategic plan itself? I, I think my one mm -hmm. question, and I'm, gonna, I'm just going to be the fan will, is really clearly defining who our customer is. I, I, you know, we for years have assumed it's the student. And again, I, I come from a business background. And the number one thing you want is talent to grow your company or your firm, whether it's small or big. So to me, we've got to make sure we understand who we're serving. I agree with you. Education is our product. I think our product is when it walks out the door and it can apply for a role or go on to the next university. I, I think uh, education is the input to our product. Um, so. I just, that was the one question I wrote down as I went through it. Um, I loved it. Um, 
The other thing that I wrote down is a review of our competencies. Do we have the right competencies and skill sets um, within our workforce to accomplish what we need to accomplish? To be more nimble, to be more quick, and to be more connected to the external workforce and the external partners that we have. So I'm, I'm not sure that we do at this point. Uh, I'm not saying that we, we don't. I'm just not sure that we do as I think about it from a workforce standpoint. One thing I'll add, each, each academic program or career program has an advisory committee composed of uh, industry experts that I think helps us make sure that our curriculum is lining up correctly. But I think that's over and never over. I think that, you know, that work has to continue. And there might be other ways to do that. Um, Andrew's still in here. I think, don't we have a thing called a tech scan we do uh, with employers to make sure the curriculum, the curriculum we're teaching is aligning with uh, the programs. I think we recently went through that in IT, all of our IT specialties, where we're bringing in IT experts to tell us this is what we expect or what we need your graduates to have. So I think we do have a process for that. I'm not saying it's perfect by any means, um, but I think we have uh, something that that's aligns with your, your thoughts and expectations and there. The only thing I'd add to that, and I think you're correct, is some career programs, many career programs, are um, overseen by the state. And so you go to the state and you make plans. The student will learn this, and this is what the state expects when the student graduates, and we always have to stay um, in line with those guidelines. Yeah, healthcare. Yeah, and, and lots of other programs too have that. One of the wonders I have, and I didn't ask it ahead of time, but as we think through, I assume there'll be measurable outcomes. So when we say increase enrollment and retention, there'll be some type of number tied to what we expect to do by 2026 and be have an annual growth measure or progress and to see if we're making progress or not? Yeah. Um, so my focus as we go through this strategic management cycle is to not just focus on developing the right plan to begin with, but really the whole process. So then it moves into an execution phase. How do we control that? And then how do we assure ourselves we've delivered the right outcomes? And so part of that process, when we get into the execution phase, and I'm going to be working with each strategic owner uh, of this plan, is developing, first of all, a business case. You know, what is the business issue or the college issue being addressed? That will then develop into a project management type approach, which means it's going to have deliverables, the basics of tasks, owners, due dates. But a real key part of that then is what defines success. And it should be something tangible, should be metrics, KPIs, something objective. And really that kind of becomes the benchmark that we measure against to know, is this initiative, is this project on track, is it not on track, as we measure against these objective metrics and KPIs. Thank you for that. Craig? I would, uh, just thinking about it, I mean, I really like, like the work and, and all the things you put together, but you know, one of the, the strengths that we need to develop, and I don't, it's not called out in here, and I don't know if it should be, but it might be, is really learning to manage change. I mean, in a lot of ways, that's why we brought you and your staff on board. And we need to have that be more embedded into the work of everybody. You know, how, where am I now? Where do I want to go? How do I get there? It sort of should be everybody's constant thought. And it probably is a whole bunch of people, so I mean, I'm not, I'm not trying to be critical. Mm -hmm. It might be important for us to actually think about embedding that skill set into the strategic plan and think about how would we know we're getting better at that. Yeah, the great point. One of the things we're going to be changing as we go forward with this plan, so the current plan, which is at its tail end, we had the strategic planning council that was meeting four times a year. And each person would get up and just kind of give an overall presentation on a long list of themes and projects. And what we're going to be doing, one of the things different this time is we're going to increase the frequency of meetings. So we're going to go from four times a year to six times a year. 
but with each meeting, it's not going to be a review of all themes, all goals, and all projects. It's going to be much more targeted, and so we're going to be going deeper. And we would like to foster more of, just like this session is, more of a working session as opposed to just kind of a report out session to where, because we typically have a good representation from all parts of the college, a lot of skill in the room, we should be assessing each other. I mean, it, really, it is all of our strategic plan. While there are certain areas that have the primary champions and owners, um, it's everybody's plan. And so it should be looked at more from how do we as uh, this entire group of people, when we have this meeting, um, make sure that all these actions are moving forward. What types of risks do we have? What types of constraints? What are the bottlenecks? What help is needed? And just make it much more interactive like that. And I think that kind of fits in with what you described, which is kind of a plan, do, check, act. So we're constantly assessing, getting feedback, putting it back into the process, making adjustments so that we keep moving forward with the plan. I support all that. <coughs> As somebody who spent a lot of time in meetings in corporate environments, I began to really hate those meetings. So I hope that's not what they're like. But I know faculty probably has a number of meetings. And I don't know, it just every, you know, every two months seems like a lot. And forever, do you, you know, I mean, I can see that you need to make some changes, but do you need to do that every two months forever? Well, one of the things I did to arrive at that point, so the Strategic Planning Council was made up with close to 40 people. And the last time we met, we had it's probably eight or nine presenters, a total of close to 80 or 90 slides presented. And there was virtually no dialogue. Everybody just gets up and presents. And so I just sensed you know, we need to apply kind of a continuous improvement um, approach to this whole meeting and its process. So I had meetings with groups of four and five people separately just to kind of brainstorm, mm -hmm. how do we make this process better? Because we don't want to bring that size, that number of people together yeah. for two hours and we just sit there silently First. looking at all these slides. And so one of the consistent themes was let's go deeper in each meeting, let's narrow the scope of what we're looking at, and let's shorten the meeting. So it's not going to be a two-hour meeting, it's going to be a 90-minute meeting. And people felt that we needed to meet more frequently because when we think about these are the items that have made their way into the strategic plan, and so by definition, they should be the most important items, and we should all be plugged in and connected to them uh, pretty frequently to understand what exactly is the status, what are the constraints, how do we keep this thing moving forward? Um, and so that was the thought process behind it. So you'd have 40 people at every meeting? 40, the group is close to 40 people. Um, it's going to be a combination of in-person. Some people connect virtually. We try to have each meeting um, with both forms. I do have a question on goal three, and it's just one that is my own opinion personally. So. Um, I believe one and two go together uh, about internal communications and, and benefit awareness. I personally feel, based on what we've heard from HR over the years, we're missing a big opportunity regarding performance management and performance information. So to me, that first one, we talked about some time ago about onboarding and getting an evaluation system that would actually provide growth and sitting with managers and getting people there. And I feel like that's just about benefits awareness isn't necessarily where I feel like we need to spend the next three years, as we've talked about, really about how do we help people grow, whether it's through leadership programs and getting, you know, people thinking through succession plans and how do we help people grow within the college to other positions, but also how do we have performance conversations around, like, what's your goal for the year? How are we going to get there? Are you meeting your goal? And I feel like that piece is missing more than benefits awareness, where I think benefit awareness really go under internal communication, how are we improving communication to make people aware? And so I think that's one I would like to see in there as a top place to work. We want to make sure people are feeling that they're getting to talk with their supervisor, know how they're doing, how can they grow, what professional development could they get if they need, is there some supports they need, there's check-ins, because oftentimes we've heard over the years that like, 
I didn't know I needed to improve in this, or I never met with my supervisor to talk about my performance, or what goals I have for myself, or where I would like to go in the college as we talk about opportunity to grow within. So I think that's one I would like to see in there personally. I don't know how others feel. My other one is maybe for DeAndre over you, is more like what diversity, equity, and inclusion initiatives are we thinking would kind of fall under this as we, that role is kind of new. I know we've taken different angles, so I'm just trying, wondering like what are the next three years, those initiatives that we'd kind of be focusing on under that. So I don't know if, I think Does I that now? Yes, okay. please. If you know the microphone so Dr. Graham can hear. Yes. So some of the initiatives that we'll be undertaking uh, over the next couple years is to ensure that we're continuing to diversify the pipeline into positions. So uh, looking critically at all the applicant data that we have available, but then also uh, making sure that we're spreading awareness of those positions within diverse communities. So that's a big part of it, diversity of recruitment. But then also we have to work on inclusion. So as our institution becomes more diverse, we have to make sure that we're also increasing that those inclusion efforts so that's we're actually retaining those individuals. There's also uh, initiatives that will be underway over the next couple years in order to register the institution with the Campus Pride Index so we can actually measure the level of inclusivity for the LGBTQ plus community. Uh, looking at expanding some of the efforts around our employer resource groups. So uh, as of this week, I think we're actually increasing our employer resource groups by uh, two more. And so we want to continue that over time. And so there's a bunch of efforts that we want to undertake uh, under DEI. And so we wanted to be a little bit nebulous there so that way there's actually a lot of room to grow. Perfect. I, I, I appreciate that update. Yeah. Others, I just want to see if others are with me or against me, you don't have to be either one, about seeing something about performance management and growth and that type of thing is needing to be in there somewhere. Rod, I see you. I yeah. think it needs to be there. And I just wanted to comment. I love where you're going. Um, rather than inclusion, I would look at do, feel, do people feel like they belong? Yeah. Belonging. Um, belonging to an institution versus being included. Um, gives folks a different sense, um, and I love it. But I also think we need to understand and have an assessment of our three deep talent for key for leadership, not key leadership, all leadership roles. Um, and do we have at least one deep by 2026, two deep by 2030? I think that's the kind of work um, that will say we're a great place to work when yes. people want to be here. So. Let's work on getting folks to where they feel like we, we want to belong. And then hopefully um, we, we can transition from a we versus them, um, what I would call mentality that exists within the college. Um, we can't have that. So to me, that would be a measurement three years from now if that's moved from where it is today. Pam, look like you had something to say. Uh, yeah, I think <clears throat> letting people know how they're doing because I know I've worked with a lot of people who shouldn't be in jobs above me or next to me. And so letting them know, because I think if you've got, if you've got people who really are not working very well, people around them know that, yeah. and they need to know that as well. So mm -hmm. I, I really appreciate that comment, that, that they need to be sort of graded on how they're doing, because yeah. sometimes they don't know that they've got a problem. Yeah. Yeah. Craig, absolutely. Your thoughts? I, I would support and really like the idea. I didn't think about myself. The idea of either replacing one of these or adding uh, something around employee growth. And I, you know, the way you described it, as I understood that, is that we would begin to develop a bench. Essentially, we we've, we've got people knowing that you're kind of on our radar, and you you know we're not guaranteeing you, but you're likely to be you know interviewed for the boss's job when you're uh, when that's a possibility. And, and I, I, I don't think that's ever been a part of the culture of the college. And with that performance management, right? Like having those conversations about goals and how do we support your growth. But some people might not know they're doing as well as they are. You know, I mean, right. I think that that's, to your point, um, Greg, to, to find out, you know, who, who's our future here? Mm -hmm. And let's let them know that that's. And how do we have leadership or training programs to help people grow into capacity or cross training and all those types of breaking down silos and getting a, a smaller level of you know, you need to work on these. A flat organization type right. of thing. Yeah, right. Mary, do you have something else? Uh, we use the term like performance management, which is broad. And as a woman of a certain age who came up when women were trying to move mm -hmm. into whatever positions, uh, my only suggestion would be for performance management, once you hire mm -hmm. someone or choose someone in a community, you have to be sure then that you have a measurement system. Yes 
that they can meet and know what they're going to be measured by. Mm -hmm. You know, the, the, the performance management systems that I'm aware of always had a measurement component and a feedback component, so I would just suggest that. Yeah, and so there are currently efforts underway to um, include a, a question around diversity, equity, and inclusion on the performance evaluation tool, and then there'll be trainings that will roll out for hiring managers and others, and you're absolutely right. We need to make sure that employees understand those expectations on the outset. And, but once and the they're measurement. hired, yeah. once they're hired, they need very clearly know how they're going to be measured. Absolutely. Yeah. Yes. And I guess with that, I just want to echo Trustee G's comment about maybe we add the B to DEI and make it DEIB moving forward type of thing of thinking. Yeah, and I think you mentioned that before it's, in a presentation, but it's, it, it, I always see it as synonymous, but it means something, it, it means a lot to other people, and so we can absolutely look at adding the B to DEI. Yeah. yeah. Any other questions or Jeff, any feedback you have for us about thinking about tweaking that last one? I know that's why we're here today to, as you finalize the final one to present to us at some point. Any other clarity, Dave, DeAndre, or Jeff, that you need from us in terms of the strategic plan? I don't think so. Anything else from trustees? The only thing I need is the dates of the meetings yeah. so that I can participate in some of them. Yeah, once those get final, you're talking about the, the yeah, the yeah. every two-month meeting type thing? Yeah. yeah. We'll make sure that trustees have that if, if Jeff's okay with that as well. Okay. Thank you so much. Uh, we appreciate that. We are going to take a five-minute break, and we'll resume at 521 with our next topic as we are back on track. Good work. Thank you. Thank you.
cool as uh, Ronnie Laker noted. Thank you so much for joining us back. The next one is the annual uh, board budget planning process for the upcoming year of fiscal year 2024. I know we've all been provided information about that, so I do know there were some questions submitted. So Mark is going to start with answering those questions first. Thank you. Uh, first, I want to make a comment that what you got and what you received is like the 20,000 foot view of everything. So when we see, when we start talking about numbers here, understand that as we go along in the process, some of those numbers will become a little bit more clear. And take taxes, for example. We, we listed the same taxes as last year. As we go forward, we'll have a better number on what the tax revenue is for uh, property taxes. Um, there's, there are six questions. <coughs> The first part of question one is something that I've asked Christine Davis to talk about, but we're going to push that to the back, which is, is the student services fee meeting our needs, those types of things, because that's really a uh, you know, student fairs issue. The, the first item that I want to talk about is the, uh, what is the cost to add a meal a day for free to each student, and what would it look like? That. Uh, the first is the, the question, we've got a new food service contract that's going to be on the uh, consent agenda next week. And uh, we have asked that uh, American Dining Creations is the name of that company. And American Dining Creations uh, did do a presentation to everybody and uh, not everybody, but for around 40 people uh, attended uh, two presentations for them. And so we're really excited about what we're going to offer. I sat down and I asked him, how much is a, is a meal, okay? There, there's a difference here. Uh, the direct cost is around 3 to $5. The uh, indirect cost, because of the way we're going to approach it, which is we want more, we want a better experience for the students. So it's really, we're going to subsidize this in the first year. So the revenue side, it really represents the cost side, and that's somewhere between 6 and $10. Uh, per meal. The question isn't really that cost, it's how much, how many students do you have and how many students will you feed? Uh, we could say FTEs, but that's not really going to get it because we've got a, we've got a higher head count. Of the 10,000 FTEs we have, roughly 30% of them are on an online modality, won't show up or we wouldn't anticipate they'd show up. Uh, we're leaving 7,000 students on an FTE basis uh, at six dollars. I took the low number. Uh, the per day cost would be around forty two thousand dollars and the fall and spring potential cost would be around six point seven million dollars. Okay. If you go to the head count, which is probably a more reasonable number, if I offer you a free meal, you might show up. So our risk is is that the fall head count uh, might be a better number, and that's 14,910. So if you say, okay, 30% of that is online, uh, and do the same calculation, you come up with roughly $10 million. Five days a week? Uh, yes, five days a week. That's $10 million uh, a year for uh, uh, fall and spring. We did not include summer in the calculation. Uh, other people do this. And as Dr. Pittman said, he believed that it was East Central. I, put, I reached out to East Central to see what they're doing and how they're doing it. And I'll get back to you when they respond. She, uh, the CFO for East Central has not responded to me yet as of, as of today. So we're looking at a fairly large number. And the question is, if there was a desire to do that, who is your, who are you trying to help? And if you're trying to help the people that need emergencies, then that head count and how we approach that would be different because there are a substantial number of our students that may not need meals. So do I give a meal? If, I, if I'm taking a class, do I get a meal? I, I don't think that's what the intent would be. So we're, we, we've got some work to do to try and figure out if there's a way to do that. And that'll come in to, to the first two parts of that uh, first question, which is the student services fee, which we'll talk about here in a little bit. So uh, to just enter into kind okay. of a back and forth discussion. You know, I think the concept is to look at how can we provide genuine wraparound services to students so that coming to college is, is 
is less of a, a risky proposition for them and less of, so feeding them is certainly a, an idea, but we could think about that a lot of different ways. I mean, you could come up with a meal plan that's very affordable and it's, it's waivable if that student really couldn't afford that. So that we didn't, we had an idea how many students are actually interested in spending $50 a semester in, in eating, you know, uh, at the college for no further cost. I'm not saying that's a good idea, but it's, it's just an example of the kind of ideas we might toss around and think about. I also think our, our mission, and I, Pam's going to think I'm stealing from her, but I am. Our mission is to help a lot of people who are, are kind of struggling in life. They have two kids at home, and they want to come to college. A free meal isn't going to solve their problems, right? Unless they box it up and take it home. Maybe we need, you know, a partnership with, with uh, food banks or, you know, and I don't know what that means. We were very impressed with the level of wraparound services we're already providing. But I think the board is willing to say, maybe we need to take another step to really almost make the case to any student who says, I can't transport myself, I can't feed myself, I've got kids i got to put in daycare. These eliminate those as reasons not to come and improve your life and, and give us a worker in the community that's doing good work for, for all of us. That's sort of where I was coming from. I, I think we understand that. The question is, what percentage of our students are on Pell Grants? Uh, Do you, you have any idea? About 50%. 50%. 50%. So that would be a place where I would want to, you know, like, Start with that's it. a given. Okay, if you're here on a Pell Grant, then you get the meal plan. You get the meal, right. And if, I, I, I don't see charging them being very reasonable, but then that cost is not so great, is it? And I think to both of those points, is there something, and I know we're getting, that's why it's a work session to get feedback on, is the meal concept, I think, came from our ACCT workshop, I think, right. is where it came from. And the feedback I got from the people at, at where did we say it was, uh, East Central, yeah. Yeah. very popular, really is encouraged their enrollment. And that's who I reached out to. Well, yeah. to try I think my, my statement was, if we can feed kids K through 12, why can't we give a college, you know, a community college kid a meal? Which means it should be federally funded. And perhaps if we show them how we've done it, then we've got a program to go to. Advocate for. Right. And I, I like the idea of thinking, I think our thing is just think outside the box of how we, and I know Christine's back there, her eyes are moving because I know she has some things she's going to say later on. But certainly it, whether we come up with meal vouchers that people and advising others can give out to kids, students, who maybe are Pell Grant or just need a need, here's a meal, go get one, and start giving it blatantly to everyone at first. There are some For options day, to right. get some thoughts going, or food banks, I think, certainly. And I think we're continuing to see the need for more, even more wraparound and making sure we have, yeah. when we heard emergency funds, I know that's one of the questions, emergency funds are almost out, what does that really look like? So I'll let you keep going on questions, okay. unless, Mary? Well, uh, I'll just, I don't know the numbers, but, in times past, a Pell Grant was up to 70% of whatever a student needed. It's down to like 30% now, is that right? Um, not for community college, it should be. Pell Grant, what does it cover for cost of college? It's 100% of community college levels. And, and they just raised it to $6,200 or something? So you're looking at about over $3,000 a semester if a student takes 12 hours with us. So that was four year institutions? Yes, yes. four year institutions, yes. All right, Mark. So, oh, I'm sorry. Before you, when we came out of the pandemic, we had identified um, student populations who were really impacted by the pandemic, who didn't come back to school. And, and to me, those are the students that I, I really am worried about because they really impact our region. Mm -hmm. And, and that's where I would say, if we're going to start, I wouldn't start with Pell Grant because you could, like I told my kids, finance your own education after the first 80000 So, you know, it was like. But they I, wouldn't get a Pell Grant from your household unless they were emancipated. Yeah, but they, yeah, but after the first 80000 they were on their own. And if they needed to finish, which my daughter did, go get your own Pell Grant. So I'm not sure. I'm not saying it's a bad idea. I'm just saying that we have data that says there are students who didn't come back after the pandemic 
And, and that's where I think we've got to go focus on it, is that data that told us what student populations stop coming to school. Those are the ones that are struggling in our community today. And if we're going to make an impact in our region, that's the population we got to go after, in my opinion. And they're heavily male. Yep. I, I, I think we agree 100% uh, with you. I mean, the need-based issue is, is what we're talking about. But I, I will tell you, one of the things that, that's, that's concerning a little bit on mine, I'm a finance guy, but we, when during the pandemic, and right, actually right before the pandemic, we had Treat America, and we basically turned off that service. And so now we're going to bring up a service from basically scratch with a new, with a new service. How that works and how it operates is a significant issue to us. So I, I think, I, I mean, I entered, I had them develop the contract or we developed a contract so it was a cost plus contract so we have some limitations as to, you know, the, what we would, could lose or whatever. But the, the fact remains is, is, is that it's going to be new uncharted territory because we haven't had a food service like we're talking about and we certainly have it. Uh, we had a lot of problems with uh, the Tree America concert. Uh, concert. It'll be at Wildwood too, correct? And, it's, and it will be at Wildwood. So um, that being said, I, I mean, we're still, we're, we're still going to investigate it. And uh, when we've got some ideas, and we'll bring those back to you uh, as to maybe how to accomplish it. Uh, it's, it's just not a, it, it can't be a carte blanche, right. is what we're saying. Yeah. It, do, it doesn't, it won't uh, succeed, at least in my opinion, it won't succeed the way you th you're wanting it to succeed if it's carte blanche. Right. If Dr. Pittman takes a class, I don't want to give him a free meal. <laughs> <laughs> I don't think he'd ask for one. <laughs> oh, no, if you could somebody's make, offering it. Make it for students that are taking some number of credits, because we know that really helps with completion. Right. So I'm, I'm just saying. Well, I, I guess here, but I guess what I'm telling you is, is, is that it's probably an FY25 issue. It's not. It's going to be difficult to implement anything in FY24. We're too. We're, we're getting too close, and we aren't even going to even, it's on your board agenda for the consent agenda, it'll be 60 days before the food service even starts. So you're talking about somewhere around April 1st, and then we're going to be into 24 before you know it. It's, I mean, I'm not saying it couldn't be maybe second semester, and maybe there's more uh, things we can do with the emergency side of it, yeah. which, uh, and, and then develop it, as long, develop it along the way. Okay. I'll let you keep going for time's sake. Okay. Um, I, there's a, a question that's going to come up on student services, so I want to give you a little background. On the student services fee, it's $5 per credit hour, okay? The budget was billed on approximately $280,000, I mean 280,000 credit hours. So when you're, looking at the, when you're looking at that, every dollar you increase would be $284,000. And uh, so when we talk about that in a little bit, you can, we, I want to give you that information. You had a question about uh, the Metro Pass. Uh, in my opinion, it's a failure. It's a fairly big failure. We received 14,000 Metro Passes for the fall semester. We distributed 692. Ooh, Lord. You just write a check. <laughs> and, and, that, and that's the key. I had a, 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 back in November, I started a discussion with by State Metro regarding the Metro Passes, uh, one of the things we have is 30% of our, is on that online modality. They don't need the Metro Passes or they won't come and get them. So, you know, should we be paying for those? And they've agreed to give us a credit. We had this contract before, so this contract is gonna have to be amended. When does the contract end? Uh, actually, it's annual. Okay. So I think we can go ahead and amend it. The other schools, and one of the things that is nice about it is we've got a key resource here, and that's uh, DeAndre. He used to do the Metro Passes at UMSL, and so he has given, me, given us some ideas. And one of the ideas, uh, and if you look at the uh, Bi-State Metro uh, website, they offer $175 uh, passes for students at schools who are taking 12 hours. If you take the 692 and multiply it by 175, you're going to find we'll save money. So at worst case, we will save money. At, at best case, we're going to try and cut a deal that would include uh, uh, a little bit more of a discount. 
The second thing is we're still, I, I may have mentioned this to you, we're trying to pilot project on trying to give uh, Metro Passes at a discount, no, no profit intended to uh, our employees. So that was the purpose and one of the reasons why I started the discussions with uh, by state in, in November and we got into discussion the online modality. So, so what's the annual amount again? I'm sorry, I should know that. How much? 300, th approximately $350,000. That if you when you see the report next week, you will see $173,000 was the first installment that and, was made. And how many employees do you think would uh, use the pass? We don't know, and that's why it's going to be a pilot project. Um, and uh, it, I still have to work out the details with Buy State on what the cost is. Uh, we're going to sell them at that discount. So uh, we have quite a few uh, employees. I have employees who use the uh, use the metro, and would I think would uh, would love to have that. And I think even at Wildwood campus, there's less access to metro even out there. That we're paying for a ton of students out there for metro, and there's probably very limited metro. Do they even have a metro even nearby well, Wildwood? They near Wildwood campus? Yeah, they have they run a line that goes, turns around at the at, 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 at Wildwood. I was involved in that negotiation. Well, let's say this. We distributed two passes at Wildwood. That t that'll tell you. Yeah, yeah. I'm going to say, again, we're paying for all these passes, so I think I appreciate you going in and yeah. diving in and negotiating, seeing how we can so offer it in a way, but make it more. So if the contract was good for this year, it'll be for FY24. We're gonna we're, we're sitting down and trying to you know, come up. Uh, the it'll be a, it'll be a revenue neutral issue on the employees. So that's that's really more of a it'll be a budget issue, but it won't be a it won't be a budget issue because I be think it's also a green issue. You get more people riding uh, public transportation. True. It you know it's so much better for the environment. Yeah. And I really appreciate um, looking at the employees for those passes because I think that's really important. So, uh, we'll, we'll, again, we'll report back to you on that. Um, so, the only okay. thing that I would add, just it's just a point of interest, is that the buses come to the colleges at times when a student can get there, get off and get to class, or an employee get to work, you know, by 8 o'clock or whatever, that they look at when the right. circle happens. Um, we'd have to do that study by campus, obviously, yeah. but yeah. Uh, it's, it, it, when you talk about employees, we end up being, do we have flexible work hours and stuff like that? So, I mean, we have all sorts of, of considerations that we have to make, but we'll, we'll, we'll get back to you on okay, this. Thank you. Thank you. On this. Um, what does uh, spring tuition look like as of 110? And, uh, Sherry, do you have that handy? Yeah, so we are actually up in spring. We're at 11.5 million in maintenance fees. That's just the tuition. It doesn't include um, the ad other additional fees. And that's up about 360,000 from where we were this exact point last year. So it's almost, correct me if I'm wrong, close to 600,000 more than what this original presentation showed of 10.8? Yes. And it's very difficult in Banner. I mean, we can do this, but when you get to Banner, if I run a report as of January, I can see what it is today for 23, but when I run it for January of last year, I get the whole month, and so you get skewed, skewed data. So this this is the actual numbers. For but people can drop, and we're still enrolling. Right. And there'll be more, a little bit more revenue still coming That's in. It's always encouraging that we're moving in the right direction and not necessarily the opposite direction. Uh, I will tell you that, and you want to talk about the discounts? Sure. Um, we are seeing that our discounts have been increasing, and it's specifically the dual enrollment discount. I think in the fall it was about 127000 more that we had um, in the fall. So again, that's a good thing. It means that we have more dual enrollment students. You hear that, Elizabeth? <laughs> and, and so that discount is increasing. We just need to make sure that, again, when we're looking at just purely the revenue number, it doesn't tell us the whole story, that we can't count that entire increase of 3% because some of that is on the discounted side. And so that budget plays into that as well. Is that the only thing that you classify under discounts? No, there's a whole lot of others. So the Jumpstart discount, it has also the Midwest oh, MSEP, I don't know what it stands for. That's where the some of the out of state can get the um, out of district. Yeah. yeah. And um, 
those are the major ones. There's some of the returning heroes discounts. All of those kind of have stayed within the same realm or a little bit plus or minus. The, the major one that was a shift for this year was the dual enrollment. Which is Martin, a good thing. Sure, question. Mm -hmm. MHEC includes the other side of the river as yes. a part of this region. Right. And that's in district? No, they get uh, in, in, uh, in state. Yeah, I don't think that's something all the employees understand. But we, we can help educate them. Because I asked a question about the other day, and I thought we had reciprocity. Uh, it's it's actually I'm out, not, I'm out not of I'm sure we're promoting it that way. It's out of district. It's not out of state. Uh, out of state. It's out of district. We have we have four tiers, and it's the second tier. It's out of out well, of district. In, it's not in district rate. But it's not the in district. It's the it's next. The in state. Rate. No. Yeah. It's the in uh, out of district. Okay. All right. Thanks. Okay. Uh, you had a question about three million dollars less in revenue and what that means. Uh, you know, from a practical standpoint, like I said, we, we're looking at twenty thousand feet. So that three million dollars is made up of a reduction in state aid of approximately a million and a half dollars, which was one-time money last year that it, we didn't carry forward this year. That discussion, in and of itself, is a long discussion, which Dr. Pittman and I could get into. But as of right now, if the governor's budget is passed and they give the uh, community colleges the dollar amount they're talking about, we would get approximately a half million dollars of additional funding from additional funds that are allocated by the state. That's of $11 million. So we are in a night, we have a 90-10 uh, formula. And that 90-10 formula with this $11 million gets just about everybody into the zone. And so we'll have to reevaluate re that for uh, FY25. In addition, NCHEMS, which you may have heard, is doing a study to talk about revamping and doing the, st uh, the funding for higher education in general. Their uh, plan is supposed to be to us by July 1st. And then there's comments and all sorts of haggling. And then uh, they're talking about uh, July 1st to 25. I mean, uh, 24. So FY25. That, it's, we, I don't want, we don't want to speculate. <laughs> but. <laughs> and then uh, on the, the, the other half of that uh, uh, $3 million was on maintenance fees. Dual enrollment, dual credit goes up. We get some benefit from that on that, but also we give the discounts. So uh, I'm fine giving that discount. Give that discount away. You heard it, Elizabeth. <laughs> Keep the dual enrollment coming. And then the last question before I bring uh, Christine up is how much money in salary and benefits for vacant positions? So I'm going to have uh, Sherry address that. Yeah, and so of course that's a moving target every day, but you know, as of this week we have about 130 vacant positions after we account for the salaries that we already reprogram in the budget we know that in the, any given year we're going to have vacancies so we reprogram some of that when we're developing the budget at the beginning of the year after that we have about three and a half million in salaries and benefits that's represented by vacant positions right now and so one of the reasons I raised that question, I know Dr. Pittman and I have had conversations, is the HR is going to be doing some studies with, uh, and correct me if I'm wrong, Dr. Pittman, to really make sure we're all on the same page of examining which positions are really needed. Is there opportunities to adjust market rates for some of the current positions to keep retention and maybe eliminate some positions that are vacant, not current positions, but eliminate some vacant <laughs> positions to adjust some salaries to get people some realignment of job descriptions to retain people and really do some deep studies around that 3.5 million to see if there's opportunities to move them things around. I don't want to get too much into detail because I know there's very early on with studying uh, from HR, but certainly want to make sure we're all kind of think that's a good move to look at and support with that. I see head nods. Are you good with that, Dr. Pittman? Okay. 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 Uh, Christine, you want to come up? Let's, uh, I'll, if you can go ahead and let her sit there. No, you got to have, well, you have the microphone. You got to have the microphone. Yeah. So. Go right ahead. 
You didn't choose the right suitcase on dealer or no deal, sorry. <laughs> <laughs> so I have the question on my phone, which is why I need to clear it up here. Uh, the first question was, is the student services fee meeting our needs, and is there a need for an increase in student aid for emergencies? Um, so I would say yes, right now it is. Um, if we wanted to expand into some of the other areas that you're talking about, then we would want to see an increase. So things like additional wraparound services for those students who are um, you know, the neediest students that we have. Um, the biggest issue we have, I think, or one of the bigger issues we have with students is transportation and housing. Um, and those are just deal breakers for students. If, if that's an issue, they're not coming, you know, to campus. The bus passes, I think we could probably talk about ways to get that to students earlier in the process. Um, and, you know, I, I don't know what the process is right now for them to get it, but if they're not getting that stuff up front, if we're not making it easier for them, perhaps that's something we could look at. Perhaps there's different ways we could provide transportation. Um, in terms of emergencies, you know, we can help connect students to resources, but our, our emergency fund is limited and it's through our foundation right now. Right now we don't use the student services fee for um, emergencies. It's really staffing, so some frontline staffing in our SARC center. So those basic needs specialist positions, some career specialist positions are funded out of there. Some, there are some other positions funded out of there right now. But um, so I mean, it is, and it's been a big, a huge help for our students. But if we wanted to do more, if we wanted to do things like books and other support services for our, you know, our BMA students, we talked about the students who did not come back post pandemic. We developed our BMA program um, as a result of that. Sorry, Black Male Achievers Program. Uh, my apologies. Um, so, you know, if we wanted to expand, I, I don't know if you all are familiar with the SUNY or the CUNY ASAP program. Um, it's, it's, it's a program that supports students. They, they provide bus passes, they provide books, they provide tuition, um, lots of other support services. So as we talk about increasing wraparound services, that would be a good model for us to look at for our students who are um, in need of additional supports. So I know for me personally, and I think we can, like even if we raise it one more dollar and put all that money towards emergency use resources to help students for housing, books, that would be something I personally would be interested in and see what the foundation can do, but I don't know if we can use student dollars. Well, here, let's, let's talk about, the uh, goal here is not to raise tuition. That's, right. that's, that's always the goal. But as of uh, the, a report you'll see next week, you're going to see that we've got roughly $767,000 in a fund balance for student services. So if you said, let's go ahead and reach out, or whatever. we can do that without raising the fee. So how, how long would that money last? How much are we spending now in a year on that emergency service? I don't know that off the top of my head. I could find I mean, would 200000 be enough? It may not, but you've got 700000 in there. Jillian, how much do we currently have from the foundation do they give towards those? So we set aside, and, and the emergency funds are $500 a student, so that's where they're capped now. Mm -hmm. Unlike when they were receiving their federal funds, it was $1,000 a student. So we're, we went from 250 to 500 through the foundation. We set aside 25000 per semester, and we're going through that. Um, the SARC staff are fabulous about budgeting that money. So, you know, at, we're, the last couple of years we've targeted the funded need at the gala just for emergency funds. So that's where that money's coming from, although we do have some, have some small grants and individuals who only give us donations for that. So, so 200,000 be quite, I mean, we're going from like 50,000 to an additional 200,000 could be substantial and yeah. reaching, and I don't know what the right number is. Yeah. Are, right. are we having um, more population of immigrants coming now to the community college since mm -hmm. we have more immigrants in, in our service area? I don't know the answer to that off the top of my head. We could find out. Um, I'm just curious. Yeah, I don't know. Rod, Craig, what are your thoughts about figuring out if we should plan budget for more emergency resources for students? to do more to support students. So you're the expert. You tell us what that takes. Okay. Rod? Yeah, I'm supportive uh, of, of a dollar increase. Um, again, I want to be uh, 
do more targeted. I'd like to understand where the, where the bulk of our students who are in need are relative to our campuses. Right. Okay. Right. So um, maybe we need to do something different than what we've been doing if we're not getting the need. Right. Are, are we really talking about increasing? Huh? No, I don't think we need to increase the actual dollar. So no. We have 750000 in there. So I don't think we actually need to increase and what do we this year. What, how much of that would we use in any regular year without? Depends on staffing. It's growing. It's growing. It's growing. So we need to, we need to identify what we want to use it for because it see. is growing. I see. Okay. And, um, you know, what it ends up at the end of the year, fiscal year, it might be a million dollars. I've estimated it. This is the student so. services fee mark? Mm -hmm. Okay. With some staffing comes up. So I think to Rod's point, I think it sounds like we're all interested in yeah. providing more resource funds out of there. Of course, we want the foundations to still do the work because I think some people feel tied to giving to that specific piece. Yes. But looking at how we can come up with some type of application, working with right. our, our advisors, right. but also tracking the information so we can get some longevity data of like where our resources need. Are there other programs we need to implement to help support? So it's not just an yeah. emergency basis right. that we have X, Y, and Z support at X, Y, and Z campus because there's a need based on what data. Right. Is that what I'm hearing you say, Rob? Yeah. And this, this came out of the last conference we went to. Um, where there was a phenomenal discussion around targeting your specific need base versus even though we're one college, figuring out where your issues are and addressing that issue because it may impact a large population right. of students. And one way for us to do that is to look at EFCs, yeah. so levels of EFCs, so you know, zero to 5,000 I think is where the Pell cutoff is or 6,000. So we can look at that and that would be a definition, the federal definition of need, yeah. you know, students. Need. And also there's sometimes needs that come up that you don't realize that you weren't getting Pell Grant or right. something and all of a sudden you lost your job. Absolutely. Or house fire or yeah. something right. else happened. Someone died who is in the family and those types yeah. of things. Yep. So it sounds like we would all support using the current funds. Okay. Not necessarily need to increase, but also looking at data collection in a way that provides some informative information about where we might need to target some supports. I think and the metro bus passes is kind of a good lesson for us. I mean, yep. it took us quite a bit of conversation to decide to do that. We were excited when we negotiated that. <laughs> All of our intents were right, yeah. but yeah. we're wasting money. So we don't want to do that. We want to give students who need the help the help. Right. But we don't want to pour money down. And get it to them quickly when they need it, I think I, is key. I, I wonder if, if we're talking about a number to move into emergency funding or we're just I think it's just when they plan their budget well it's and, and just from a directional standpoint I'm assuming what I'm hearing is one dollar credit hour so if we take one dollar against the fund balance for the emergency funds or whatever so if it's two, 280,000 okay. would be the number yeah. uh, and we would eat into the fund balance by, by so that. it's really about 330,000 if you had the foundation amount uh -huh. current in there that, plus that would be significant plus yes. that and so we would put, you know, if that's what your desire is, we'll just plan on putting that in the budget. Thank you. Let's, let's Dr. Davis, that. did I hear you say it's transportation and housing that's impacting our students? The most? Often, yes. Transportation, so, housing, some food. Yeah. But we, we handle that through our food pantries. And we do have partnerships with the food banks. But I, I think with this, though, Rod, because it's not a $500 cap through this fund, we could actually help people with rent and other things where the foundation wouldn't get us there because it's $500, right. which isn't going to pay most emergency rent or whatever the case that's may right. be. Light bill, you know, electric bill, gas bill, whatever. I think that determination is made through SARC, right? Yes. Okay. Is that what you were pretty much going towards, Brian? I'm really thinking radically different. We, we have so much space. Why not convert some of that space to housing? And why not? <laughs> I'm really thinking radically different. I mean, we are. Green houses, even those type of things that you've seen around the world. It's based on our campus. And I'm not saying that's the right solution. I'm just saying. Yeah, we're just brain <laughs> We have rented, you know that, we've yep. rented space from UMSL in there for our international yeah. students over the years. And I'll add what we've learned through the child care center <laughs> at Forest Park. Which is going to open when? It's radically expensive to convert our current facilities yeah. into living spaces yes. or support yeah. spaces. Yeah. Um, I mean, it, you'd be cheaper knocking something down and building something. <coughs> what we currently have right. into living quarters.
supporters because of the asbestos issues. It, in the it may be cheaper that. to do rent support. That's it. I, rent, I would suggest that in the past we've the used landlord or so. uh, at, I'm, I'm speaking of Fort Valley directly across the street. There were apartments, you know, and there were and there was agreements when we. This is back when we had the Spanish students coming. You know, uh, we had a grant for Hispanic students to come. And so we were able to use housing by UMSO. We were able to use housing by Florida and Valley. Since the students, it was a Florida and Valley initiative, they didn't go further out, like into, I don't know, Webster Groves or whatever, because the initiative didn't go there. But we had more uh, success with using that kind of housing. But, but what I wanted to add, when, when the students had housing, like down at UMSO, to get to Florida and Valley, that's when the bus passes were so successful. So if we did decide some way to supplement housing, my suggestion would be to supplement housing that we see that's near the campuses so that we should then place those students and also get them there. And sometimes when you think out of the box the way you are about that situation, you have to think about the students who come here and they may not want to come to a campus where they don't know that people, especially given the news lately, where people are on campus that are not students. It does get sometimes a little scary. I do have a question. Do we know, and I don't know if we even click this, how many of our students are classified as homeless? So in K-12, we have mckinney Vento, so we clearly identify. Do we have a number don't or any yeah. idea of how many are we like? We don't collect that, Dr. Martin, in any sort of formal way. Um, probably our SARC offices, you know, as they talk with students, would have some ideas, but it's not a formal. Because I just think, you know, there's some school case, 12, 12 school districts who purchase like a house essentially, and then you may live in this house right. off campus. I'm not trying to get in that direction, but anyways, I think. What other questions do you? I think I had one other part of the question. Yes. Yeah, so question number three. Does student services have the right amount of staff and support needed to carry out everything? Is the restructuring what is desired and the outcomes being met, specifically the four VPs and having a bucket while also campus responsibilities? So um, that was a mouthful. Um, I think it was the right is the right approach. I think the, the structure that we have is absolutely the right approach. There's one area where I, I believe they need support, um, and that is in the area of student rights and responsibilities, student conduct. They are on the front lines with a lot on the campuses, and so I actually have a position in the hopper to help support them in that way, and so that will kind of take them out of that first level of interaction with students who are referred to them for various things. Um, and then, so we'll have a coordinator position, and I've identified funding for that position. So I won't be asking for anything out of the, of the budget process to uh, support them in that way. But I, I do believe it's working. Um, you know, we've got four solid vice presidents on board, Julie Massey being one who's here tonight, and I think they're doing a great job. Great. Okay. That's what we didn't want to assume if the structure is working, not working. And so thank you so much for that. We look forward to that. One, uh, one, one yeah. question that Pam had that didn't get answered was on the CDLC, we're talking about June 1st. There, it's supposed to be certified in on May 15th. Forest Park. Over Child Park. Oh, Child Park. Child Park. Child Child Care. Yeah. And what's the date? Well, they're talking about certification in the month of May, and so then you'd start with June. It's still not even done being constructed yet, right? No. No. <laughs> Substantial completion, I think, is March 7th. March, and they, they actually are putting in the curtain walls right now, so the glass walls are going in at this time. We actually had them delivered and um, work is proceeding, are we wrapping it up soon? Which this is just a sign for our future projects, how much everything gets delayed and all that with the times that we're in. Okay. Doors. Yes, <laughs> doors I hear are year long out, so. Any other questions from the trustees? Uh, I know I loaded them with a lot of questions ahead of time, but certainly I think the presentation was helpful to get a clear idea of that. Any other direction or comments from the trustees about where they'd like to go as they plan the budget ahead? Now's the time we don't want to come in May and say, well, we really want this, this, and this. Well, there's lots of stuff we want. Correct. You know, it's not Christmas here. And Correct. <laughs> Thank you. There's no, you know. Bob, you good? No free money. Uh, Doris, you good? I'm good. Okay. Thank you. Thank you so much, Sherry and Mark. The last few minutes, we're almost on schedule. Look, we're doing really good today. I said 6.30 would be the hard stop. We're going to be done before that. I wanted to vote about. You don't know that. 
10 minutes. Uh, this is an opportunity for trustees throughout the year to do learning. Next week, we're actually going to ratify how much we spent on learning to be transparent. So one of the things we need to do is educate ourselves. And so we've had a lot of conferences and opportunities to attend various things. So this is an opportunity. Many of the things have already been shared out through the various aspects that, that come up tonight, and I appreciate that. So this opportunity to share anything that you've learned that we've not shared already up to this point in the various work sessions or board meetings. So we're going to start with Mary. We'll go Mary, Rob, Doris, Pam, Craig, and myself. Okay. Uh, no, I think this is really good productive work headed in the right direction. Uh, always I'm looking for with the board brainstorming opportunities. I'm not sure how we can do that in a, and yet it's not a meeting. Right. You know, but And a work session. Yeah. But uh, where we could, this is a work session versus a retreat where you're just brainstorming and trying to come up with new concepts or whatever. So I would always look at to that in the future as a possibility, but no, I think this was very productive today. Why do you want to share for ACCT, MCCT, or any of those other conferences um, you learned that you No, I think I've shared, but I, I keep coming back to looking at what your regional impact is by campus. Um, it was a huge takeaway from ACC. Um, um, I had it written down in my notes, and I can't find it now for the MCCA conference, which was also good. But I think we're on the right track. This is good work. So would your idea that we would have some kind of community advisory group or whatnot or involve the businesses in, in that area? I almost think, think about that how we could maximize our impact at Forest Park, Wildwood. I mean, yeah. I, I think that's what you share. That, that, that's where I'm at. And I also believe that we as a board may benefit from having some advisory groups come in from industry so that we hear from them directly as well. Um, as you know, I've been hammering on build the relationships with the community first, and they'll tell you what they need, and we're finally getting there. Um, mm -hmm. Well, there are a lot of existing organizations that we, we often work with that we could be a little more direct and ask them to think yeah. about how to advise us. Um, North County Inc., just give an example, but you know, mm -hmm. West County has a chamber. Thank you. That's it. Dr. Graham, anything you want to share from any of the conferences you attended? Town hall meetings. We're, we're going in a good direction. And I think that uh, one of the workshops that I attended, they talked about how effective the town hall meetings were. And since I've been on the board, uh, we haven't had a town hall meeting except when we were trying to uh, hire a, a president or a chancellor. So as we move forward with our new direction here that we just went over tonight, as things become more clear to us, we need to share it with our community. Got it. Thank you. Pam? Well, a couple things. One is the, uh, the STEM program. There's a lot of money for community college in this because most of the traditional four-year colleges have, ex have exp they've expended most of that. And I know that we, we had someone that was involved with this program, the STEM program, and I know that they would be really happy to talk to us because of uh, geospatial. So I, I would just really like somebody to take this folder and kind of run with it because they really want to talk to us. Yeah, Trustee Ross, so Rory Bielek already has that and that's part of an NSF grant. He's, he's pursuing that. Okay, thank you. Awesome. And, and the other, um, the other um, program that I thought we really need to look at is in North Carolina, they, um, they recruited back st students who had children but dropped out because of sort of the children and so they reached out to those uh, people that had some credit hours and they made such an extended um, program for them like they they upgraded they, they they had to work with their gpa and so they just did a whole lot of things that each um, student really needed and i think that we probably have a lot of those people especially because of the pandemic um, but they were talking about the 25 to 35-year-old um, mothers. Those were the 
those were the people that were most likely to come back and finish. And we have so many programs that will get them into a job pretty quickly. So, um, and they talked a little bit about in their marketing that they wanted to show photos of older people because most of our photos are of, of young students. And so, you know, you sort of need to reach out to people <laughs> that you want to track. And let's see, um, they, they worked with each returning parent so that none of the roadblocks get in the way, which I think we pretty much do already, but they were very specific and they said that they had a um, graduation rate that was approaching like 80%. So I think that that's a program. And maybe, you know, maybe we can work on that, get it a little bit more clarified. Uh, I took a lot of notes, but they're kind of, you know, helter-skelter. And I'd like to kind of go through that um, again and kind of come up with a more um, on-target plan. But I think those are the people. We want to reach out to those people who didn't finish. We know they had an interest. So if we babysit them through the program, I think we get, they had a big increase in, um, uh, uh, <laughs> people just, a lot of people came back into school and so their, their numbers worked a lot better. So anyway, that was a, a program that I thought was really, and that's in North Carolina, so. Thank you, Trustee Rock. Okay. Dr. Mm -hmm. um, I sent out, uh, I think, <laughs> what I've seen at ACT. At, at a, I didn't end up going to very many of the smaller groups because we were presenting at uh, MCC. I did read an article, and it really follows up, Pam, on what you were saying. Is in the Association of Governing Boards, which is kind of a different group of trustees. It's all kinds of trustees from private, public, and, and uh, two-year colleges. And I've gone to a few conferences of theirs, and, they, and I get their publication. And they highlighted a, a partnership between a college and a community college that was really working on how do we help a student base that's clearly changed. So one of their first steps was to really get to know who are our students. They're a fairly small uh, uh, liberal arts college, but they, they, their enrollment was going down, as is true for a lot. So they ended up doing a whole bunch of wraparound services and they often partnered with the community college close to them because it just kind of made sense that they could deliver those services together. I'll, I will copy that article and send it to you all. It's, it's not the solution, but it's very uh, supportive to the conversation that we've had here tonight about the student and their research around their students is just pretty dramatic is that the typical college student in the United States now is struggling financially. I mean, you know, if you take out the colleges like Yale, where that isn't the issue, but if you look at the number of students in college, more than half of them are genuinely struggling financially. And most of those are in community colleges or college like this one that, that's, that's highlighted. And if we want more people to get advantage of a college education, we're gonna have to figure out how to make make it possible. Thank you. I'll say for me, one was, I'm sure you're surprised, Guided Pathways, which uh, led to quite a conversation with Dr. Pittman of really getting, looking at some colleges that made some transformational changes with Guided Pathways and how to get there, as well as dual enrollment and how we can continue to increase that. Another one's about belonging and how do we create institutions belonging. And I think back even where we were, this is already almost six years on the board, which is crazy to think that I've been here for six years, but I feel like we are at a very different place, thanks to Dr. Pittman and his team of like leading us I can clearly see a difference in the organization, I feel like, from my level at least, of things we're trying, things we're instituting, addressing problems. I feel like we have a clear direction of where we're trying to go, although not always perfect, certainly more defined than um, that and being responsive and proactive, not just reactive to things and getting us to where we want to get to the future. And certainly uh, it takes work and I appreciate everyone's efforts in the room of being willing to try different because sometimes it's hard because there is pressure and the board has always not been this board who I believe is very supportive of the work and it's not always been the case of delivering that. And I think we learn as we go learning about how important a good board is, just because we always agree does not mean we're not having conversations and asking those tough questions. It means we're, we're governing at the right levels to get us to a place. And 
I think the most important thing I've learned over the years of these conferences is how important the trust is between our sole employee of Dr. Pittman and the board and being able to trust the vision and direction and being able to work together to push each other's thinking and tell us when we're getting out of our lane and telling him that we need him to get back in a lane type of thing and working together. I think it's so important to trust and we learn that at the conferences. And that's not always the case in many institutions where they do struggle, there's turnover of leadership, the board is dysfunctional, um, they're not doing the work they're supposed to do. Also, you have a lot of places where they're appointed, so you have a lot of politicalness involved in terms of elected by the community, and so when you get appointed by different governors, whatever the case may be, that creates other issues. So I think we're fortunate to be in a place, and it reinforces my thoughts of like the work we need to do. I look forward to our next ACC conference, and certainly I think one that I'd like us to see as we get out there for Christina prepares. Like I think we need to tell our story about our wraparound services and even the student services fee of how we change pretty quickly of providing some services for students is transformational compared to other places. They don't all have that. We haven't had that fee around even adding social workers. I'm sure there's a lot of colleges that don't have even social workers and thinking about that story is other trustees are really talking about, these conferences have a lot of conversations about removing barriers and not everyone's always always there. So I think that would be great to tell our story next year about that as I think about what, what could do. But so I think there's been lots of learning and we'll continue to grow. And if you ever find anything you want to learn in that's outside of ACCT, whether it's the American Governing Council or some other conference that Guided Pathways Con Con Council, so I think it's appropriate to bring the board and ask permission to go to it because I think it's important that we're looking at things to learn and grow our own bank of knowledge to be able to be the best we can to help support the college and, and the work that we do. But otherwise, I truly appreciate everyone's time here tonight. I truly appreciate your all time. You do get Monday off, I hope. He's not making you work on Monday, but uh, certainly thank you so much. And we will be right back next week for our regular scheduled board meeting. We'll be out by 4.30. I'm now committed to uh, being out by 4.30. So we start at 3.45. We'll be out by 4.30 next week. So thank you. Thank you.